Okay. So welcome to our uh, class this evening. And tonight we're talking about apostolic versus pastoral ministry. There's a lot of talk nowadays about apostolic ministry. What is apostolic ministry? We also know that for any of us that grew up in church, the main model for ministry was what we call pastoral ministry. Yeah. Which is the shepherding of a flock really is having a, a primary leader pastoral ministry and that leader being the shepherd and everybody else being the flock and then leading them you know closer to the lord growing in their relationship with the lord dealing with their struggles but there's been a a whole new movement and you know in revelations it says basically this is what the spirit of the Lord is saying to the churches. And I believe in each age, as we try to attune our ears, our spiritual ears to the heart of the Lord, that he starts to say something that's in line with the Bible, but he always emphasizes and brings out a different aspect as we move into a new wineskin. And one of the new wineskins that's happening right now is what we call apostolic ministry. So we're going to delve into what that means and try to get a deeper understanding of it, because I believe each one of you all that are on this call is actually called to become apostolic. That you may have experienced pastoral ministry in your past, but you wouldn't be connected to us if you were not being called to move in a greater way in apostolic ministry. So as you're listening, and I want you to just listen to this as an educational thing, but I want you to listen to it with the fervor to know that you're called to move into what the spirit of the Lord is saying today. Make sense? Let's look at the word apostolic versus pastoral ministry and just get some of the fundamentals of what that means. The word ministry in Greek is diakonia, or as you can see, it's, it's deacon. And that word diakonia or ministry means to attend as a servant. It also means one who executes the commands of another. So, for example, if Leon had a company and I was working for his company, my job would be to basically serve him and to serve whatever his wishes are for his company and also to respond or execute whatever commands that he gives me. And so, Oftentimes, people think of ministry as someone who is at the high end of the totem pole. But the original notion of ministry is actually one who comes under and serves another. And Jesus taught this upside down, in a sense, type of ministry when he said, he said, uh, that you must serve and not to be, become served. That, that true ministry, whether you're uh, a bishop or whether you're a pastor or whether you are uh, uh, whatever position you hold, you're actually called to come under and serve others. And also, anybody that's in ministry is called to execute the commands of another. And ultimately, that's the Lord, right? He's the chief shepherd. And so all of us are under shepherds whose job is to execute his commands. But not only that, is to serve each other so that I can serve you in a way that brings out the best of who you are. And we're going to get into the difference between apostolic and pastoral in a minute. The word apostolic 
comes from the Greek word apostole, and it means to be sent. It means to be sent out from where you are to another place with a specific mission. The word apostle is based or apostolic is based on receiving a specific call, being sent out with a specific mission to carry out something that the Lord has called you. The original word is a secular term, and it was created during the Roman times when Rome would conquer a foreign land. They would send, Caesar would send admirals out to create Rome in that foreign land. He would send the Roman admiral, and that admiral that he sent out to change the structures to look like Rome that admiral was called an apostle. And so Jesus basically baptized the secular word to try to describe what he was doing when he chose his own apostles. He said, you are ministers who will be sent out with a specific mission. Now, that mission can be to a geographical area. For example, Halakim and I were clearly called to the city of New Orleans. It was very confusing to us because it didn't fit under a pastoral paradigm, but it was definitely being sent out to a geographical area. Sometimes your calling might be to a specific people. It might be to a specific uh, genre of people. If you think of someone uh, like, uh, I'm trying to think of the lady that, that founded the Aglow movement. And she was sent out to minister to a sphere of intercessors and has great influence and is a leader of them. But that was her specific mission. My question is, what is your specific mission? Because you are called to be apostolic. And what is the, it doesn't have to be a city. It doesn't have to be a state. It could be, but it could be a group of people. It could be a, a certain subsection of society that you're called to. But all of you all are apostolic in a sense that you are sent, and I believe you're called like a Roman admiral being sent out like Caesar to a certain group, to a certain place to bring the kingdom of heaven. Now compare apostolic to the word pastoral. Pastoral, uh, poimen, I think it's pronounced, is the Greek word. And it basically is the Greek word for a shepherd. And what does a shepherd do? A shepherd leads a flock of sheep. If you compare pastoral ministry, which is having a leader who's leading a flock of sheep, an apostolic leader, apostolic is having a person who is sent on a specific mission to accomplish that mission. They're both important, but they're different nuances. Now, historically, in five ministries in Ephesians 4.11, and I'll bring it back to apostles and uh, pastors in a minute, but in Ephesians 4.11, Paul talks about the different ministries that Jesus gave his church. And he says he gave the apostles, the prophets, two, the evangelists, three, the shepherds, or pastors, four, and teachers, five. So he points these five roles, and then he says this is what these five roles are to do. They are to equip the saints for the work of ministry. They are equip the saints for, for the work of serving others. Number two, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Notice these five ministries were appointed 
to equip the saints, build up the body of Christ, and to bring all into the unity of the faith. Has this happened yet? Has it been complete? Absolutely not. So in my own eyes, given that this hasn't happened, it was still very much in process, that these five ministry roles are still utmost important and are still in effect today. Many cessationist theologians will say that the only two viable ministries left is the pastors and the teachers. And if you look at some of our traditional denominations, that's basically, in some of them, that's the extent of the ministry roles that are sanctioned, is that we have pastors in churches and we have teachers in churches, but you don't go to many traditional denominations and hear the word apostle or hear the word prophet or even hear the word evangelist. Yet, God's trying to do what he wants to be done in these, which is stated in this Ephesians 4.11. And in order for him to do it, he has to restore all of these roles and all these ministries. That the, the pastor and the teacher are very important roles, but it's incomplete without apostles, prophets, and evangelists. Now. Historically, the establishing of these ministries, I'm going to look at it just historically, which is interesting to look at. The teacher role has been consistently there since the beginning of the church. If you look all through church history, you'll find consistently teachers. Even during the Middle Ages, when the primary ministry role was the priest, the priest was also a teacher of the catechisms, the word of God, the the dogmas of the church, the teachings of the church, was always a teacher, even in the very early church fathers, all the way down through the centuries, teacher has been a consistent ministry in the church. And if you say that you're a teacher in ministry, you're not going to get much flack because everybody understands that. Now, pastors was actually restored at the Reformation over 500 years ago. Like previous to the Reformation, the main roles in the church were bishops and priests, which priest is actually a role, role which is a carryover from the Old Testament, right? And it wasn't until the Protestant Reformation that Protestant churches began to be led by what we would know as pastors today. And then the Catholic Church started to integrate some of those teachings, and they could even, they started to call their own priests and leaders pastors. So you could go to a Catholic church and you can find that some of the flock will be, members will be calling their priest their pastor, right? You go to a Protestant church, they'll call the leader a pastor. And so those two roles are accepted roles in the church and have had a long history. But just having those two roles, the church is missing it's only having two of the five batteries needed to empower it in a sense. Now, the third role, the evangelist, actually wasn't restored on a bigger basis until the 1950s. And one of the greatest examples of that is Billy Graham. Previous to the 1950s, anybody that called themselves an evangelist, church members would look at them kind of Google-eyed like, what are you talking about? But Billy Graham, and there was a whole movement, uh, Luis Palau, who happens to be uh, Ed Savoso's brother-in-law, uh, some other people began to reestablish, and it was what the Spirit was saying in that time, 40s, 50s, 60s, were reestablishing the role of the evangelist. And now today, in 2022, you have people that are recognized as evangelists. That's a an accepted role in the church. But if you go previous to 1950, they wouldn't really agree to that. That wasn't an accepted role throughout the church was to have an evangelist. Evangelism was important, but the role of the evangelist. What happened in the, in the 1980s, 
began to emerge the phenomena of the prophet, people started to uh, reignite. Uh, the spirit started to wake up that role. And you had a whole prophetic movement that began. Uh, the fellow last night, uh, David Fang, you know, grew up in Bill Hammond's church or, or ministered there and was, was trained there. And Bill Hammond has been, you know, a leader in prophetic ministry and has trained many, many prophets. And even today, you know, you can have, you have people come into town and there could be recognized prophets and, and there's an understanding of that. But, you know, previous to the 1980s, say 70s, if you go back to the 60s and 50s, you didn't have people calling themselves prophets. If you said I was a prophet, they would say, well, are you, you know, Jeremiah uh, reincarnated or something? I mean, it just wasn't an accepted, accepted role. But today it's much more accepted. It's because the spirit began to wake up that in the 80s. And then the fifth role, which is being re restored, has been the apostles. And the apostle role started to get momentum back in the 90s. And previous to that, you might have had some apostolic movements, but you didn't. You had people that were actually functioned as apostles, but they really were not called apostles. You think of John Wesley, who started Methodism. You know, he was definitely an apostle, but he was never referred to as an apostle. You have other leaders. But today, that's more of an accepted term. And it's the last role that's really been reestablished by the Holy Spirit. And it's gaining some level of acceptance. But it's still a little awkward when people are referred to as apostles. It's like, what are they calling themselves? What does that mean? And uh, is that just a title? You know, certainly, like Ed Savoso is very much an apostle. And we'll see as it goes. But he's a leader of other leaders. He's not a leader of a church, but he has tremendous influence. And his influence has caused him to uh, lead individuals and ministries all over the world. And so he's definitely a, um, an example of an apostle. Another one is, um, is what's his name? The, the founder of YWAM, uh, Lauren Cunningham. I mean, he doesn't have a church per se, but he's, he's a, a leader of leaders and has established one of the most powerful missionary movements in the last hundred years. It's just extraordinary. And he's just an extraordinary leader with a great deal of influence of leading other leaders. And he definitely would be called an apostle, even though he may not refer to himself in that way. But there's this whole movement of reestablishing apostolic. What we're looking at tonight is the difference between apostles and pastors or apostolic ministry and pastoral ministry. So let's get into that. What's the difference between pastoral and apostolic? Pastoral is focused on helping people receive salvation. Pastoral is about helping people receive Jesus in their heart, giving their life to the Lord, receiving eternal life, and having, having a, a, a sureness of what will happen after they die. It's about ministering salvation. For the apostolic, that's important, but apostolic is actually bringing salvation here now in the true sense of the word salvation. We know in uncovering the word of salvation in the New Testament, it means healing. It means deliverance from de demons. It means uh, a breaking off of strongholds. It means uh, the invasion of the kingdom in a situation where hellish things are eradicated. It's about bringing salvation here right now and bringing that mighty force into the present and the person experiencing heavenly realities right now and not waiting to the future. Apostolic has the sense of being much more 
aggressive in the spirit about bringing manifestation. It's not just simply receiving a connection to heaven, but it's receiving heaven descending down into earth. Pastoral is just like a pastor, a pastor who builds and maintains what we call a traditional church, not the ecclesia as we understand ecclesia, but maintaining that church on the corner with members and nurturing that group of people, which is very important. But apostolic is about taking territory. It's about recognizing the church on the corner, but taking the rest of the block, taking the neighborhood. It's about taking territory for the kingdom. So when you look at the Bourbon Street House of Prayer, that's not establishing a church and having a nice ceremony every Sunday and bringing people in and, and reading the word of God and writing. No, no, it's apostolic. It's an apostolic movement that we're going right into the heart of our city, into one of the darker places, and we're taking territory for the kingdom. And do we know how to do that? No, we're just being obedient and raising a banner of worship and inviting his presence and seeing what he will do. But it's about going into enemy territory. That's apostolic. That's not pastoral. Pastoral is about isolating and separating. It's about separating myself from a sinful world and isolating in my corner and preserving my holiness and my purity and not being tainted by the sin of the world. Apostolic is about penetrating and infiltrating. Apostolic is about getting my hands dirty in places that are dirty. It's, uh, how does Ed say it? He says, he says it's about swimming in, in uh in dirty water without drinking it. It's about entering in and penetrating and infiltrating places that are dark, that are that uh, places where no one else will go. It's, it's being on the offensive and not the defensive. Pastoral has a defensive element to it. Apostolic is not. It's, I'm going in. You know, at one point, Jesus said he was the person that brings peace. But when he was talking about the apostolic, he says, no, we're bringing the sword and we're separating. We're separating. We're attacking. There's this whole notion of two sides of him. But I think it's when he moves from the pastoral into the apostolic, he moves into ascending out a lot more of an aggressive mode. Pastoral is hoping for signs and wonders. And how many of y'all, like myself, have experienced uh, church milieus that there was a hoping that sickness and disease would change through prayer. I uh, was hoping that miraculous things would happen, but it was more of a, a wishful thinking that we would like something to happen. We're asking God to intervene. There's not a whole lot of faith for it, but uh, there's a lot of accepting as God's will, things that are actually from the evil one. There's, there's not that same level in the pastoral of expectation. But in the apostolic, there is manifestations of signs and wonders. In fact, I can remember a time when Holly Kim and I started traveling and and we started being exposed to some apostolic ministries, which I would consider like uh, Bill Johnson and, and Randy Clark and uh, Mahesh Shabda. And uh, the, certainly Bethel is very apostolic. And we started being exposed to these ministries and we started seeing these 
manifestations of signs and wonders. Things were happening. Miracles were happening. And that was in being exposed to that, that was so, so exciting, but so abnormal to us because we were so used to the pastoral of praying and not expecting. And all of a sudden being in a, in an environment where there was great expectation and there was manifestations and there was things happening. And I think that you and I are called to move into the apostolic and to, to lift up our expectation and to say that I, I'm expecting signs. Look, I'm expecting when I pray for someone with, with a hurt back that their back will be healed, that something will happen uh, miraculously, that, that when different things we're confronted with, different situations that have an element of impossibility, there's a part of me that rises up in the apostolic and says, this will change because God is bringing his kingdom here. We don't have to wait for it, but it's invading this place right now, and signs and wonders are normal. If you look at the last, I mean, my experience in the last 15, 20 years being exposed to some of these apostolic ministries, that my own expectation has increased exponentially. And I haven't always got the manifestations that I want, but I've had a lot more than I ever have. And I think it's because I made a shift from the pastoral to the apostolic. In the pastoral, there's more praying and supplicating. But in the apostolic, there's a decreeing and a declaring and an expectation of manifestation here and now. If you look at the way Jesus did a lot of his ministry, a lot of it was apostolic in a sense that he would decree and he would declare things to happen. And he didn't pray. There was a certitude that when he said, be healed, that that would be manifested. There's a, there was a certitude that when he spoke to the evil spirit and he told him to go, it would go. Wouldn't it be nice if, if Holly Kim could speak to someone who's suffering with an addiction and she just says, addiction, go in Jesus' name. And in that moment, the person, it's broken off of them in a second. That's the decree and the declaring. And that's apostolic. Pastoral is caring for a flock, which is important. To provide care, the pastor gives, the flock receives, but the apostolic is empowering leaders. It's saying, Mama Kelly, you can take your neighborhood in Harahan. It's saying uh, to, to Frank or saying to Scott that that vision and that dream that the Lord has put in you is there for a reason and it will come to fruition. And we're going to stand with you and empower you until it does. Apostolic is not just caring for individuals. It's empowering individuals to become leaders in their own apostolic calling. Pastoral has a certain level of spiritual toleration. What I mean by that is pastoral has this toleration that... Um, Things that are not of heaven get tolerated. And apostolic has the sense of spiritual domination. There's this understanding that I'm going in and I'm called to dominate the situation and to take it over. There's, there's more of a toleration in pastoral, but there's a, a notion that I'm dominating, not because I'm strong in myself, but I am carrying the one who is wanting to dominate and to take territory and to bring the kingdom 
here now on earth. I could add it. I don't have it there. You know, pastor is about finding a road to heaven. Apostolic is about bringing heaven to what? To earth. <laughs> Glory to God. <laughs> so in Matthew 10, this was an apostolic commission. Jesus said, and he called to him his 12 disciples who were his apostles. And look what he did to his apostles. He gave them authority over unclean spirits. When you call to the apostolic, he gives you authority. Over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every sickness and every affliction. Then it goes on and says, these 12 Jesus sent out, that's the word apostolos or apostle. Jesus did what? He sent them out, instructing them, gave them specific instruction. It goes on to, which I eliminated, I didn't want to go into it right now, but I just wanted you to see, he took, he did the, took the 12, he authorized them, then he sent them out and instructing them as proclaim as you go, the kingdom of heaven is coming in the future. No, no. He said the kingdom of heaven is here at hand now. And then he says, this is the word of the, the, the fruit of those who are being sent out. This is the fruit of those who are apostolic. They will heal the sick. They will raise the dead. They will cleanse lepers and they will cast out demons. The Lord is stirring up my faith and your faith to be more apostolic today. The Lord is stirring us up to increase our faith and I believe release an authority over each one of you, you all, that you'll have a greater authority to heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons. In this passage, notice he's given authority and he's giving healing ability. Number two, notice it's apostolic. He's sending out with what? A specific mission. Number three, he's declaring what will happen is that the kingdom of heaven is, hand, is at hand now, and there will be what? Signs and wonders. And number four, the kingdom is here on earth. It's invading earth right now. So what are the implications? Number one, each one of you all are called to be apostolic and to be a leader. Are you called to be apostolic and to be a leader the same way that I am and the same way Holly Kim is? No, no. But you're called to be apostolic and a leader in the way that he's calling you. You know, Peter and Paul were both apostolic, but Peter was called to the Jews and Paul was called to the non-Jews the Gentiles. They both were apostolic, but they had different callings. Each one of us has our own sphere, a geographical area. Number two, you have a specific fear, sphere or a specific geographical calling. And many of y'all may have a sense of what that is. And if you don't, let's pray about it and let's let the Lord reveal it to you. You would have not been brought to us here at Voice of the Kingdom, Transform Our World, New Orleans, if you were not called to be apostolic. Number three, the Lord is releasing authority today for signs and wonders. In fact, I'm calling on the Lord right now 
to release authority to everybody under my sound of my voice for a greater degree of signs and wonders as they decree and declare and pray that your manifestation will happen more and the invasion of the kingdom of heaven on earth will increase today, beginning today and going forward in Jesus' name. Number four, begin exercising your authority in faith. Do you have to have a lot of faith? No, you have to have the faith of a mustard seed. But you need to begin to exercise your faith, exercise the authority, the increased authority that the Lord is releasing in you. And number five, which is certainly something that I've needed to do and each one of you all need to work on also, is we have to stop spiritually tolerating things that are intolerable and begin learning spiritual domination. How to spiritually dominate. Is it dominating in a controlling way? No. It's dominating in a way that the manifestation of heaven infiltrates hellish situations on earth. It's not about power and control. It's about unleashing the power and control of heaven into a situation. It's not about becoming someone who's more powerful and controlling and above others. It's about actually coming under others. And when you come properly under others, it can bring heaven down to earth upon them. So we're called to stop spiritually tolerating and to begin dominating. Jesus' name, amen. (laughs) Well, we're going to process in a second, but uh, if you'd like to give, I want to give you a moment to, to go ahead and give. If you'd like to give Venmo, give the Voice of the Kingdom, uh, PayPal, Voice of the Kingdom dash New Orleans, or you can go to voice of the kingdom.org website and give that way, and, and that'll help support the work that God's doing here with us and through us. So, we thank you if, if you are able to give, and we bless those uh, that which you give, and we ask the Lord to, to bless them and to uh, expand it backwards to you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.